Our Father, we thank you. We can meet together as a church. We can look into your word this morning. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would encourage us. He would uh, give us insight, uh, help us to focus, help me to explain clearly. And uh, he would give us a, a good insight into the, the general layout of the book of 1 Corinthians. We uh, just pray, Lord, that you encourage our heart. I pray that you, you would um, give us perspective. Just help us to know how you're thinking and, and uh, general direction this morning as we look into your word. We thank you for it. We pray for your guidance and your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, we'll start right at the beginning and we're looking at the author and the, uh, the date to start off with. And most of us, if not all of us, would know that the author of 1 Corinthians was Paul and he wrote it around about the year 55 AD when he was in the city of Ephesus. He was ministering to the Ephesians. Uh, we know that Paul was in Ephesus for around about three years and apparently he wrote the book of 1 Corinthians toward the end of his time uh, there in Ephesus. So toward the end of his stay in Ephesus. And the recipients, obviously the, the believers in the city of Corinth. Now, what was Corinth like back in those days? Well, with respect to its geographical location first, uh, can we have the slide please? Corinth was located around about 60 kilometres west of Athens uh, in southern Greece. Which direction do I point this, Tim? Anywhere? Okay. Okay. Uh, good. And I think I've... Yes. Okay. So there we are. Corinth was situated around about, about there. That's the Roman province of Achaia and Macedonia to the north. And uh, Corinth was just beside that land bridge there, uh, which in some places is only about six kilometres wide. And it's, uh, Athens is over in that area. It was about 60 kilometres west of Athens and on that land bridge. So that land bridge, as you can see, connects uh, southern Greece with northern Greece. And so that made uh, Corinth a commercial centre. If people wanted to go from northern Greece down to southern Greece, if they were traders and they wanted to, to go there, can you see that they had to pass right by Corinth? Okay. Uh, not only that, but also traders in the Aegean Sea, like uh, at Ephesus and Philippi and so forth, if they wanted to um, ship their merchandise over to Rome, what they would do is they'd put their, their cargo on their ships uh, what have I done there? They put, the, yep. put their cargo on their ships. I'll try again. Okay, uh, take it down the Aegean Sea. They would go through those islands there. They wouldn't go around that area there. That's a bit like the Cape of uh, Good Hope, South Africa. Very dangerous waters. What they would do is they would sail in the bay there, they would unload, unload their cargo, put it onto uh, land vehicles on wheels and so forth, push it across to the other side, load it on the ships again and they would go off to Rome, off to Italy and other places and so forth. So can you see that uh, Corinth was a commercial centre? We've got all this cargo going north and south, going east and west. And of course, if they can offload it and sell it there in Corinth, they're going to do that. And so uh, Corinth was a, um, was a commercial centre. Okay, that's where they would uh, transport it across. Nowadays, got that off Google, nowadays there's a, a canal that they've uh, uh, they built about a century ago. Okay, we'll come to that one in a few moments. Okay, so geographically... Uh, Yes, so it, because of its geography, it became a commercial centre and therefore was quite wealthy. Now, with respect to its social situation, uh, Corinth was extremely immoral. Now, you just, just think, okay, we've got all these, these traders coming down from the Aegean Sea and passing through. They've got money and uh, there's wealth and that uh, was a, uh, one of the reasons why... Um, Corinth was such an immoral 
city with money, with wealth. These men are moving around. They go to Corinth and are uh, um, involved in immorality. But another factor, probably a bit more important than that, was that one of the pagan religions that was established there was the worship of Aphrodite. And Aphrodite was the, Greece, the, the Greek goddess of love. And uh, one of the ways that the, the adherents of, of that form of worship would worship their god was to be involved in prostitution. That was one way that they thought that they could worship Aphrodite in prostitution. And uh, there was a temple up on the, the mount there. Not, not this one just here, okay, but that one up there. And the story goes that there were about a thousand prostitutes that were based in the temple up there and they were available there for the traders but also for the locals and at night they would come down and uh, wander the city the streets as well uh, that was the worship that was the worship of of aphrodite it was all all part of it and uh, so corinth was a prosperous indulgent and morally depraved city it was grossly immoral even by pagan standards something else with respect to the social situation was that the, the Greeks, as you know, loved uh, philosophy and that was one of the characteristics of the people who lived there in Corinth as well. They loved philosophy. They loved uh, discussing uh, different ideas, new insights, people's perspectives, uh, debating, listening, considering, pondering. That was ancient Greece. The Corinthians were Greeks and they used to do that as well. You can turn that off, thanks, Tim. They, they, they loved philosophy. And uh, those who were competent at debating and presenting uh, new ideas and so forth uh, were highly regarded. Uh, they had status. Uh, in, in our culture here, we've got uh, guys like uh, Dustin and Buddy uh, are rega regarded as being... Uh, very significant, uh, important people because of their prowess in Aussie Rules football. Well, the same thing happened back in Corinthian, in, in Corinth, among the Corinthians in those days. People who could debate really well or teach really well, or present ideas, they were highly regarded. They had status, just like Dusty. Okay, so uh, socially, the people were very immoral. The city was very immoral and they loved philosophy. Okay, well that brings us to the occasion and the purpose. Why did Paul write the book of 1 Corinthians? Okay, and two things come to mind when we consider that question. While Paul was at Ephesus, he heard some very disturbing reports about things that were going on back at the church at Corinth. Some people from the household of a person called Chloe made the journey across the Aegean Straits there and walked up to Ephesus to meet Paul and they delivered a very concerning report about how the church was going back at Corinth. It was not good. But also, the second thing is, Paul also received a letter. Possibly not at the same time. It may have been another group of men that went and visited him when he was in Ephesus. But they took a letter to Paul and in that letter, the people of the church themselves asked Paul some questions about issues that they were struggling with as a church, things that they really didn't know what they should do. And so because Paul was busy at Ephesus teaching the people there, the believers there, he couldn't go immediately himself and sort out the problems or answer their questions. And so what he did was he sat down and uh, through someone who helped him, he wrote a letter which we call the book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, so that's what we've got here. So why did Paul write 1 Corinthians? It was because he was addressing a number of serious problems and issues that involved the church at Corinth. Okay, and that brings us to an outline. The outline of the book. Okay, one way to analyse the book is to divide it into five sections, which we're going to do this morning. The first section is the introduction, first uh, nine verses in which he introduces the letter. Second section is the section where Paul um, talks about the report, the oral report that some people brought to him about some very concerning things that are happening back in the church. He discusses those things that he heard. 
The third section, Paul answers the questions that they sent to him via that letter. The fourth section, uh, which takes us about to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul speaks about the resurrection. And the last section is a conclusion to the letter. Okay, so we'll start off with the, uh, the introduction, the first section, section one, and that goes for the first nine verses. And in that section there, Paul introduces himself. He calls himself Paul the Apostle. He puts that word apostle in because he wants the Corinthians to know that he has the authority to speak to them and to advise them on behalf of God. He has divine authority. He's the author and the recipients are the Corinthians. Now, Paul in chapter 1 describes them as the church of God, saints, brethren, and people who will be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, Paul is writing to believers, to Christians. Now it's good to keep that in mind because as we go through uh, the book this morning, you might be wondering, well, <laughs> are, they, are they really believers with some of those things that they were doing? But yes, he was writing essentially to a church uh, who, were, who were believers. The recipients were believers. And that's section one, the introduction. Section two is a section that goes from the end of the introduction to the end of chapter six. And in that section, uh, Paul responds to the oral report that some people from the household of Chloe uh, went to him and, uh, and gave to him. He's very concerned about a number of things. Now, the first thing that he wants to, uh, to, to, to discuss that was reported to him about was the fact that there are factions and divisions among the people, among the believers. Just take your Bibles, if you would, turn to uh, chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll look at verses 10 and 11. There are factions and divisions among the people. Chapter 1, verse 10, Paul writes, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Okay, so Paul's desire is that the church be united harmonious group living together. That's what he wants for them. But he says in order for that to happen, they're going to need to be joined together. Now that's a term used to describe um, when broken fishing nets are put back together or a, a vase or a pot has been dropped and it's being glued back together. Paul said that the fellowship needs to be joined back together. And uh, that will happen as they come to think alike with oneness of mind, being like-minded, and also having loyalty to one another in their behaviour as well. So that's the first um, issue that he needs to address, the fact that there are factions and divisions. Now, why? Why? What was the cause of that? Why are the people not getting on with each other in the church? Well, Paul suspects that the main problem that has caused this is the fact that they've allowed the thinking of the world to penetrate the church. They're thinking like they're unsaved neighbours. Now, how can we say that? Well, how, how's it been manifested or seen? First of all, in the way they viewed the gospel, we can see it in the way they viewed the gospel. They're thinking like the world in the way they viewed the gospel. Now, remember that the Corinthians were Greeks and the Greeks were lovers of wisdom and philosophy. Loved it. They really enjoy discussing profound truths and, and, uh, and new insights and details. However, Paul heard that some of the believers in the church at Corinth were apparently thinking like their unsaved neighbours around them. They were thinking that the message of the Messiah being crucified on the cross wasn't really all that profound, wasn't really all that intellectually stimulating and they were balking at it. They were reluctant to witness, weren't really interested in hearing about it. 
They preferred instead to listen to teachers that had more profound, stimulating, intellectually uh, stimulating ideas. And that's the way of the world. That was the Greeks. That, that was the way the Greeks thought. That, that, that was just normal Greek thought. But you see, Paul heard that the believers in the church at Corinth were thinking like that as well. So how is the fact that the world has got into the church, how is that reflected? First of all, in the way the believers viewed the gospel. Secondly, in the way they viewed God's servants. Okay, as we mentioned a few moments ago, the Greeks exalted people who could speak really well and debate really well. And again, that sort of thinking was brought over into the Corinthian church. Paul heard that the believers were expecting their teachers to be really competent speakers, to be really engaging speakers. And they compared the ministers of the church with one another. And those ministers, those speakers that could speak really well to the congregation, some, they, would line, they would line up under them. They, they, would, uh, they would exalt them and say they were followers of, of those particular teachers. And other teachers that were still learning or not quite so proficient, they were avoided. Uh, they, they were um, disparaged or um, disregarded. And so again, that's, that's the thinking of, of uh, Greek culture. A third way that... Uh, this sort of thinking was manifested was the way that some of the teachers themselves went about their task. Some were apparently teaching uh, things that were in opposition to what Paul was teaching. They were discrediting Paul and even opposing some of the things that Paul said. And uh, they were doing that so that people would follow them instead of following Paul. Now that's Greek. That, that was the Greek way of life. Teachers would roam around, gather together a group of disciples, that, that what, liked their philosophy and, uh, and they were teaching and of course they would be paid for that. Some of the Corinthian teachers in the church, they themselves were thinking like that too. And they were disparaging Paul and trying to, to get a group of, of uh, disciples to follow them instead. And so uh, that was the cause of the brokenness. The people of the church, they were in factions. They... Uh, they were, they were disagreeing among themselves. And so in order uh, for, for Paul to, to bring the church back together again, and to restore unity, you had to correct thinking about, first of all, the nature and importance of the gospel, the superiority of God's revelation over the wisdom of the world, the proper role of Christian ministers, the nature of Christian ministry, and Paul's own credentials and record as an apostle. And we find Paul discussing those things in the second half of chapter 1, in chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4. The world has gotten into the church. Okay, that was one of the very concerning things that uh, was reported to Paul as he was uh, ministering there in Ephesus. Another thing that these people reported to Paul about that he had to write to the church at Ephesus about was a matter concerning lack of discipline in the church. And uh, Paul covers that uh, aspect in, in chapters 5 and 6. Sinful things were going on in the church that weren't being dealt with. They were just casually being just overlooked. Now, obviously, that would have been also very concerning to, to Paul because immorality in the church is something that weakens its testimony and uh, weakens the church as a whole. And so Paul deals, deals with some of these things. Matters of just lack of discipline. The first matter in this area concerns a form of incest that was going on that he heard about. Uh, and that's in chapter 5. I'd like to read verses 1 and 2 of uh, chapter 5 where Paul raises this. Okay, verses 1 and 2, Paul writes, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. 
and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Okay, so apparently there was a professing um, believer living in sin with his stepmother. Now, this wasn't just something that the deacons and the pastor knew about and they talked about it at their regular um, diaconate meeting. This was something that the whole church knew about. Everyone knew about. It was, it was common knowledge. But people were just ignoring it. No one was particularly concerned. Oh, it was good to talk about, but no one was particularly concerned about doing something about this. Listen to what Paul says in verses 4 and 5. 4 and 5. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So Paul says, listen guys, you people need to confront this matter and you need to discipline that young man. You need to put him out of the church. This is needed not only to, to protect the, the, the testimony of the church and the purity of the church, but also for his sake as well. So that he would realise the serious thing that he's doing through, to, through his own self. He's standing before God. You need to do something about, about this matter. And don't ignore it, but put him out. Discipline him. So the first matter regarding lack of discipline concerns uh, incest, a case of incest in the church. The second matter regarding, same thing, lack of discipline. People were just ignoring things, letting things happen. Concerned uh, litigation in the church. And uh, Paul deals with that in chapter 6. And we'll just read first, uh, first, first one, first of all. Litigation. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? So apparently uh, some of the believers in the church were taking other believers in the church to court in order to resolve their disagreements or possibly just as a way to get money from them. That was uh, a very common practice among the Greeks back in those days, taking other people to court in order to, uh, to get some, some money from them. Now, okay, again, th this was going on in the church. So the thinking from the outside had come into the church. Some of the believers were doing this too. And uh, the church as a whole were just ignoring it. They were just allowing this to go on. So Paul urges them to do something about it. Just not, not, not to, not to uh, take these matters to the secular courts, but to try and handle these matters in-house. Uh, he says, come on, there are some fellows among you that are, are quite competent. Go before them. Get them to, to listen to what's going on and to give advice and to try and sort out these sorts of issues. But don't hang your dirty washing out in front of the secular courts. In those days, the public would have come and just like they do in Papua New Guinea, and stand around the, uh, the magistrate and the, the people involved in the, in the case, and uh, they, they listen. And that is not a good testimony. Paul knows that's not a good testimony. If, if the Christian church is fighting among itself, is um, going through litigation, and, and, and people are upset with each other, that's, that's no testimony. Paul says, go in-house. Try and work out your, um, your legal problems uh, in-house. Settle them between yourselves. He talks about that in chapter 6 in the first half. In the second half of chapter 6, there's another matter, again, that wasn't being dealt with. It was just being overlooked. And that concerns sexual immorality among the believers of the church. Now, we know, you've heard, we know that the city of Corinth was uh, well known for prostitution. Those traders up in Philippi and over in uh, uh, Ephesus and Thessalonica, uh, Thessalonica and Italy and so forth, as they went backwards and forwards and down in Archaea and uh, Macedonia, they knew, they knew what was going on in, in Corinth. Prostitution was rife. Corinth had a really bad name 
for, for prostitution and for the, the, the sexual conduct that was going on there. And once again, this sort of thinking was carried over into the people, the people thinking of the church. Okay, some of the believers themselves of the church were actually sleeping with prostitutes as well. Not just the traders and the visitors from, from uh, distant cities and that, but people of the church themselves. They were involved with sleeping with prostitutes or involved in adultery. Listen to what Paul says as he concludes his comments about this issue in verses 19 and 20 of chapter 6. He's talking to believers. He's saying, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So Paul hears this matter as well, and he tells the people of the church, listen, don't just ignore these things going on. You've got to address them. You've got to address them as a church. And, uh, and don't just uh, be, be lax on discipline. Discipline those people uh, that, that, that are disobeying God and, uh, and, and do something about these issues. Don't just ignore them. They're not on as far as believers are concerned. Okay, so that takes us to the end of um, Paul's discussion about the report that he heard from people of Chloe's household that made the, the, the journey across uh, to Ephesus to meet up with Paul and to share their concerns. So that's, that's what Paul writes about, about those things that he's heard about. And that brings us to section 3 of the letter. And in section 3, Paul answers a number of questions that um, the, the Corinthian believers have asked him themselves. They sent a letter to him. And Paul covers um, those questions in chapters 7 right through to the end of chapter 14. Okay, he's answering questions to uh, give them a guidance that they've requested. So what did they ask him about? What are their concerns? Okay, well the first one that uh, Paul deals with is in chapter 7 and it's to do with questions concerning marriage and celibacy. Should they marry? Or um, if someone has lost their spouse, should they remarry? Or should they remain single? Okay, now they asked Paul that question because apparently there were people in Corinth, aesthetics, who were teaching that it was more godly to remain single and celibate than to marry. It was more godly, more pleasing to God. Okay, so Paul discusses that uh, in chapter 7 and uh, he replies by saying that basically both the single life and uh, marriage are good options. They're both good options. It's not either or. They're both really good options. But both of them have their disadvantages as well as their advantages. But basically, both good options. Generally speaking, though, marriage is the preferable one. Marriage is advisable. Chapter 7, verses 8 and 9. Chapter 7, verse 8 and 9. Chapter 7, verse... Uh, 8, Paul writes, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, in other words, as a single person. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Okay, so uh, both are good options. Generally speaking, though, marriage is advisable. However, if a person does choose to marry, then they should endeavour to stay married. And so they really need to give it good thought before they enter into, into marriage. Now, also in chapter 7, we hear that uh, there were some people in Corinth 
that some believers in Corinth were wondering what they should do if their spouse was an unbeliever. Some of them were wondering if they should uh, leave that spouse, if God would want them uh, not to be married to the spouse because the spouse is an unbeliever. It's interesting, uh, we had that same question uh, asked up at Aura. Um, a young guy was uh, saying, well, you know, what should I do? My, my wife isn't a believer. Should I rouse her uh, or should I stay with her? And just on that topic, just about every issue that I, I'm going to cover this morning or I have covered already, just about every issue has been relevant uh, up at, at uh, Aura among the cold people that we work with. Just about everyone, um, including this one. Okay, let's look at uh, verses 13 and 15 of chapter 7. Okay, what should a, a fella or a, a lady do if their spouse is an unbeliever? Well, Paul, he answers them, he gives them advice. In verse 13 he says, And the woman which hath an husband that believes not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. And then verse 15, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Now there are also other matters concerning marriage that Paul touches on in chapter 7. Uh, but that's a, a good sample um, of, of chapter 7. So he speaks about marriage and celibacy and gives his, his advice in that chapter. Okay, now, so what are we doing here in chapter 3? We're looking at questions. Questions that the Corinthians are asking Paul. That's the first one that he covers. Another question, next question that he addresses, uh, it's covered in chapters 8, 9 and 10, and that involves attendance at idol feasts and eating meat that has been offered to idols. Okay, now the problem was this. Before people in the church were saved, many of them attended social functions at pagan temples that were scattered around Corinth. And there were lots of them, just like the couple we saw on the, the screen a few moments ago. It was just part of their social life as well as their religious life. But yes, they would go there to, to worship their, their idols, uh, their pagan gods, but they would also go to socialise as well. It was just social life. What do you do on a, on a Saturday night or whatever? You go down to the temple and, and you meet your friends and maybe have a barbecue down there and do some socialising. Now, the question that the Corinthian believers had was, now that they were believers, was it still okay to socialise? In temples like that. Now, maybe the you know the the, the religious stuff they they realised okay we're not into that anymore. But was it okay to go to the pagan temples for social purposes and catch up with your your old friends? Now there was another problem too, which is closely related, and that involves meat that had been offered in temples uh, like that. Uh, you've got a big idol. Uh, of a false god uh, and uh, people would uh, make a sacrifice, they would barbecue up uh, a bullock or, or something and then the people would socialise by, by eating that meat. Now because there were so, so many temples and so many people going and making these sacrifices, there was a lot of meat coming to the temples. There was more meat that, than the priests could eat and the people could eat. And so uh, what the priests used to do is they would take their portion that was owing to them for, for their duties. They would take their portions, go to the local market or a market attached to the temple itself and they would sell their meat to the public. It was their way of, of raising support. Uh, okay, so so go all this meat now uh, that... It, is in butcher shops, in, in markets available for the public. And it was good quality meat and apparently the price was very good as well. Now, the question that the believers had for Paul was, is it okay for us as believers 
to go to these markets and buy meat like this that has been offered uh, or may have been offered to the idols, take it home and barbecue it and eat it. Is that okay or is God upset with us if we do that sort of a thing? And the people in the church, they were on both sides of the fence of it, on it. But they didn't really know how to resolve that issue so they wrote to Paul and they asked him. Uh, okay, now how did Paul respond to these, these two issues, related issues? Well, before he gives his answer to the specific questions, he deals with an attitude among some of the believers of the church that isn't healthy and it's causing friction. You see, some of the people of the church, as they discuss this matter and other matters like it, some of the people were saying that they had the liberty, they knew they had the liberty to go to the temple and to socialise or to go to the butcher shops and to buy the meat, eat it. They knew they had the liberty because they had knowledge. They knew that there were no false gods. Those idols were just bits of stone or wood. No gods. There's only one true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. They knew that. They knew that they had the liberty to do these sorts of things. Okay, Paul realises that that attitude is quite strong in the church. And so he spends much of chapter 8 and chapter 9 dealing with that first before he answers their questions concerning the temples and the meat. He says, just because they think they have the liberty to do something doesn't necessarily mean they should go ahead and do it. Christian liberty is not the rule for Christian behaviour. Christian love is the rule for Christian behaviour. Yes, you might have the liberty to do something, but how's it going to affect your Christian brother or sister? How's it going to affect your church? In chapter 9, Paul uses himself as an example to teach this. Okay, he was an apostle. He arrived at Corinth years ago as an apostle and he taught them. He had the liberty to collect a salary from the Corinthians as he taught them. Uh, not only as he evangelised, but uh, after that as he taught the church. He had the liberty to collect a salary. Did he collect one? Did he enforce those rights? Did he exercise that liberty? No, he did not. He did not. He worked uh, night and day making tents as, as well as teaching the church. He didn't receive a thing from them. And he, he said he was pleased to do that. But he didn't do that. He didn't, he didn't exercise his liberty because well, you think about it. If Paul had arrived, he's got a, he says he's got a great message to share and then he collects a salary. What do you think some of the, the people are going to be thinking or their neighbours are going to be thinking? They're going to be thinking, okay, he's just in it for the money, isn't he? Okay, so Paul didn't exercise his liberty and, uh, and uh, he's using himself as, a, as an example. Uh, to try and, and deal with that attitude that was very strong among some of the believers of the church. So he points it out first, don't live just by your liberties, but make Christian love, love. Let that guide your decisions. How's it going to affect the people around you? And um, you wouldn't believe that uh, this sort of thing, like meat and idols and so forth, would be something that we would wrestle with in Adora, but yes, I was surprised. I taught this and um, a day or two later I had one of my guys come to me and says, we know exactly what you're talking about. And he related something that, uh, a, a situation that he was involved with when he went out uh, to another village. Anyway, so, so Paul is using, using himself there. And then he answers their questions. So after he deals with the attitude, okay, he answers their questions. He gives them some guidance. Summarising, basically, he says, yes to the issue of eating meat. It's okay. The meat won't make you sick. God won't be upset if, if you go and buy some meat. Yes, it's been offered to an, to an idol somewhere. You eat it. It's okay. It, that's okay. But keep in mind, um, if, if it's offensive to your neighbour or to your brother or to other church members, no. So yes, yes, but with provisos. Uh, don't do it if it's going to offend someone else. 
And then to the issue of going to the temples for socialising, Paul basically says, no, it's not on. Look with me, if you will, at uh, verses 14 and verses 20 of chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 14, Paul writes, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. And chapter 20, uh, verse 20, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So Paul teaches that there's more going on as those people in the temple sacrificed to the, the, uh, the stone statues and so forth. There's more going on than meets the eye. Don't get involved in that, you believers. Keep away. What about catching up with their friends? Uh, 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 uh. Keep away. That's not on for Christian, for, for, for believers. And so that's the guidance that he gives them concerning that. Okay, so another, another group of questions that he addresses. And we arrive now at uh, chapter 11. And another collection of uh, sort of group of questions that he answers refers to matters to do with Christian conduct or, or matters of conduct when the church meets. Okay, now the first one, so when the church meets together, okay, how should they interact and behave and so forth. The first question they asked him in, in this area concerned the practice of women continuing to wear their head coverings. And that's in the first half of chapter 11. Now in, in those times and in that culture, the wearing of a head veil or head coverings was a symbol that the women were under the authority of their husbands and they were submissive to them. That was a sign in the culture um, that the woman was submissive to her husband. And in some cultures today, it is still a sign, especially in the Middle Eastern cultures. Um, it still is it's, it's a valid sign. It shows that the woman is in uh, submission to her husband. In other cultures, it, it is not a sign. It is not a sign in our culture among the coal people. In fact, it is a sign, but it carries a very different meaning in our culture, in coal culture. Uh, if, if a person, including men, if a person has a veil over their head, it's a sign to communicate the fact that they are sick. They are feeling very sick. It communicates that. Now, back in, in Paul's time, in, in this culture, uh, for various reasons, some of the women of the church at Corinth were starting to attend public meetings with their heads uncovered. They, they leave their veils at home. And that was concerning, that, that was causing concern among the believers of the church. They didn't know how to handle it and whether it was proper or not. And so they asked Paul for his advice and for, for his input into that. And he deals with that in the first half of, of chapter 11, just talking about uh, giving his advice concerning what they should do. In the second half of chapter 11, uh, we move on and we've got uh, another question concerning the practice of communion, the Lord's table. Okay, some of the believers were apparently treating the Lord's table as if it was a real trivial matter and they were even abusing it. They, they had a, a feast connected with the Lord's Supper called the Love Feast and some would come and commit the sin of gluttony and then they'd sit down and pray and give thanks for the, to the Lord. Others were drunk and basically it was um, something that they were treating with uh, in a trivial manner. So Paul writes to them. He talks about the origin of the Lord's Supper and the significance of it. And he warns them not to take it lightly. It's a very significant um, event in the life of a local church. And so he gives them advice and warnings concerning the Lord's Supper in the second half of verse 11. And that takes us up to chapters 12, 13 and 14, where he comes to um, another uh, issue that they've asked Paul about. And that concerns the topic of spiritual gifts and especially the sign gifts and especially prophecy and tongues. Okay. 
So Paul talks about the exercise of spiritual gifts in 12, 13 and 14. And he does that because the believers at Corinth are very interested, particularly interested in the spectacular sign gifts and especially the gift of tongues. You see, okay, come on, let's, let's, think, let's think context. They were Greeks. They've come from a, a background of many of them would have come out of those pagan temples worshipping false gods and idols. They've come out of that very pagan uh, background of false religions. And in those false religions, there was ecstatic speech. Occultic practices were not uncommon. And many of them... Many of these uh, practices involve supernatural things. And so some of these believers in their unconverted days, they would have witnessed supernatural things, ecstatic speech and so forth. And it seems that they've brought that sort of thinking over into their, their church life, into the church meetings. They're very interested in the whole idea of people speaking in tongues or what they thought was speaking in tongues. It's very appealing and very attraction, attracting to, uh, uh, to, to those Corinthian believers. And so Paul has to deal with that and he has to, okay, spiritual gifts, yes, but uh, the way they were being practiced wasn't right. So he's got to, he's got to straighten that out. He's got to bring order. He doesn't rule out spiritual gifts, but he's got to get everything in its right balance and context. And so in chapters 12, 13 and 14, he discusses the purpose of spiritual gifts. They're intended to unite and to strengthen the young church or, or, or the church, the body of Christ. And he also talks about the way they should be practiced in an orderly manner, in a spirit of humility and love, the nature of which love, the nature of which is outlined in chapter 13. Chapter 13 is given to us in the context of spiritual gifts. And if the Corinthians follow those guidelines and the, the way of love, that should have dealt with a lot of problems uh, that they were experiencing in the church as they endeavoured to... Um, to use those spiritual gifts. It should have um, sorted out a lot of those abuses that were going on. Okay, so that was uh, the exercise of spiritual gifts. And uh, that takes us to the conclusion of section three. We arrive at what I think is another section. I think uh, section four stands alone. And in that, um, Paul speaks about the concept of uh, resurrection and he does that because there were some people in the church at Corinth who were doubting that there was such a thing as a resurrection that a resurrection was going to happen uh, and again think, think contextually they were Greeks in the Greek way of thinking uh, the spirit after a person dies the spirit lives on goes into the afterlife but in the Greek way of thinking, the body, once it's put in the grave, it's finished, all over. And again, some people of the church were bringing that sort of thinking into the church and uh, they were doubting that there was a resurrection. Okay, now, as Paul deals with this whole topic of resurrection, right throughout chapter 15, marvellous chapter, but one thing to realise is that although the resurrection of Jesus is mentioned in the first few verses, the chapter is primarily not about that. It's not about the resurrection of Jesus. That's just Paul's starting point. Paul's mention of Jesus' resurrection was just to establish the fact that there was at least one. So there is a resurrection. There was at least one. The focus of his talk is not on Jesus' resurrection. The focus of his talk is on our resurrection. Our resurrection. The resurrection of our bodies. Body of believers. And so he does that. He, he teaches about the fact of, river, of resur, uh, resurrection by mentioning Jesus' resurrection from the dead. But he goes on and he speaks about the sad consequences if there were no resurrection, if our bodies just re remained in the grave, uh, the order in which the whole um, aspect of, re of resurrection will occur, different phases, different aspects to it, the type of body we will receive 
and the motivation that knowing this provides. How we should serve Lord, the Lord with zeal, uh, knowing that um, our, our, our service for the Lord counts and um, we will receive a wonderful new body at the end of this lifetime. And so chapter 15 is about the concept of resurrection. Your body, if you are a believer, your body is going to be resurrected from the grave unless you're raptured um, uh, beforehand. It, you will receive a brand new body, different abilities, different capabilities, different nature. Paul speaks about that in chapter 15. And then that takes us to the, the final section, section 5, in which we've got some concluding remarks in chapter 16. And Paul speaks basically about a collection that he's organising. Uh, believers then in Jerusalem were going through some sort of a famine or difficult time and Paul's organising a collection to be taken uh, down to them to help them. And he also speaks uh, about some travel plans as well. Um, how he's going to, where he's going to be, where he's going and, uh, and so forth. And then finally he finishes up at the end of the chapter with some last words of advice, some greetings, names different people and a benediction. So that was a quick survey of the book of 1 Corinthians. Now I realise, okay, it's, we, it hasn't been a preaching message, it's been teaching. I realise when you do something like this on a macro level, um, you're not really looking for details that are going to, bring out, going to bring about life change or going to answer questions in our lives that we might be asking, specific questions. I know that doesn't happen when, when you're just getting a big picture or a bird's eye view of something like this. Okay, what we've, trying to, what we've tried to do this morning is just, to, yes, to get the big picture so we've got the context for working out through details and so forth. So as we read through and study our way through uh, 1 Corinthians, we've got the context that we can answer specific questions um, from. Nevertheless, I think that we can find some applications uh, from a look at the book as a whole, and I've listed three, and we'll conclude with this, these three applications. Okay, so what do we get from a helicopter flight, not, not walking through the jungle, but from a helicopter flight way over the jungle? What, what can we take away with us today from that sort of a... A view viewpoint. Number one, I think we can take away first of all this having an exalted position in Christ with the guarantee as God's people of a wonderful future in heaven like we read about in Ephesians chapter 1. It doesn't necessarily mean that we will be without our issues and problems as we meet together in a local fellowship while we're still here on earth and as we go through the book of 1 Corinthians uh, that stands out, um, that's very obvious, isn't it? Very obvious. Okay, full of problems, problems everywhere in the church there at Corinth. Hey, listen, if, if we strike a few problems and issues as, as we continue in, in, in our meeting uh, as a church, don't let it jolt your faith. Don't let it rock your faith. That's just what it's like in a Genesis 3 world. Problems and issues will happen. And uh, as Paul has done, he's given advice and, and directions and so forth. And he wants those people just to work through the issues, work through the problems and try and resolve them. But don't let problems or issues jolt your faith. It's just part of, of life. It's part of the Christian life. Number one. Number two, the influence of secular, biblically uninformed thought upon the life of a local church can be very significant. And that was one of the main themes of chapter 2, when people were paying more attention to uh, secular Greek philosophy than what they were to the revelation of God and, and the gospel message. So, so because of that, believers need to be really discerning. We all need to be discerning with respect to the ideas and cultural values that we take on and that we bring into the church. We need to be discerning. And number three, 
our fallen human nature is a cause of many problems. <laughs> many problems. Okay, in chapter 2, we touched on pride and a desire to be exalted. Chapter 3, spiritual immaturity. Uh, we saw lust and sexual sin in chapter 5 and 6. Greediness, selfishness, lack of brotherly love, unbelief. It just goes on and on. Okay, our fallen human nature is the cause of many problems, so we need to guard against that. We need to guard against its influence by ensuring that we are in constant fellowship with the Lord. Don't let your old human nature direct your paths. Okay, open yourself up to the, the Spirit of God and the Word of God and uh, let's make sure we're in fellowship with the Lord and uh, let that give us our marching orders. Not the inclinations of our old nature, our old fallen human nature. Okay. So three applications I think we can take away validly from just a survey of the book as a whole. Okay, let's pray and then I'll hand it back to the pastor. <clears throat> Our Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Lord, we understand that you know us through and through. You know us better than what we know ourselves. Uh, just, Lord, we've got a, a reflection not a very desirable one, but we've, we've seen what a human nature is like. Even human nature uh, that exists in believers that are attending a church and just the different things, problems and issues that can arise uh, from that. Father, we thank you though that you've given us your word and you've given us the Holy Spirit to help us to live the Christian life. And I pray, Lord, that he would do that. He would uh, help us to understand your word. He would empower us to follow it. And he would put joy and gladness and peace in our hearts that uh, we desire to follow it and to, to live in a manner which is pleasing to you and which is best for us. Please, Father, encourage us, enrich our church, enrich our personal lives. Help us to follow you faithfully. And we thank you for your help. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>